Good morning, everybody who's just joining us. Morning. I like that we can see like the little hand of Barbara just in the back. <laughs> <laughs> just coming out of the corner. All right, if we get a few more people just joining in, Lynetta, so I'm letting them in, but you can, I guess, go ahead and maybe we'll just give it one more minute and we'll get started. Sure. Looks like our last couple of people are just connecting to the audio. All right, I think we're good to get started, Miss Lanetta, if you want to launch us off. Yes, thank you. Good morning. Hi, everyone. My name is Lanetta McIver, Director of Multicultural Outreach and Engagement, AARP, Louisiana. Before we start today's cooking show, I'd like to take a few minutes to tell you something about AARP. In Louisiana, we proudly serve more than 430,000 members with offices located in Baton Rouge and New Orleans and volunteer teams and chapters throughout the state. Presently, our offices are closed due to the pandemic, but we're working together to bring events and activities to you such as this. Today, it's all about Thanksgiving which we know is the largest food celebration of the year, a time to bring family together and give thanks for everything that you have. We have an exciting menu plan today with new recipes that we traditionally do not use in our kitchen. Maybe you've um, prepared cornbread dressing, but the scratch recipe that you were presented today will allow you to make your own cornbread dressing with different variations. Additionally, spaghetti squash as a side dish. I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to incorporating the fennel into our spaghetti squash dish. I'm excited to learn something new. I'm excited to introduce a new recipe to my family. And this year I'm full of excitement because I'm going to incorporate many of the recipes that we've tried um, during Wellness Wednesday in the past. For example, our, our butternut squash mac and cheese, that will be included. Our strawberry and watermelon drink, that will be included. And I'm looking forward to what I could include from today. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Heather, who will go over a few technical tips and we'll get the show started. Heather. All right, thanks, Ms. Lynetta. Um, I am just gonna switch back over here to my gallery view so I can see everybody. Uh, good morning, welcome. My name is Heather Nace. I am the Director of Operations for the Goldring Center for Culinary Medicine. I know a lot of you are familiar with us, um, but if for some reason you're not, we are the teaching kitchen for Tulane University's School of Medicine. That means that we teach medical students all about nutrition by teaching them how to cook. And we also offer great community programming um, for the public as well, which is really fun. And we've been doing these AARP classes um, for this last year, and these have been really a great way for us to continue connecting with our community members and friends particularly when, you know, we haven't been able to get together in person as much as we would like. So we're glad to have you here this morning. Um, Chef Amber, who is the Assistant Program Director 
um, is cooking from her home kitchen today. She's going to be leading this class and I'm here in the office managing all the tech. So I just want to go over a couple of things real quick. If you're new to Zoom or maybe not so familiar with the functionality, I just want to mention a few things that you can keep in mind. So um, we have you all muted just to keep the sound level down while we're doing the class, um, but we do welcome any of you to unmute yourself and ask a question if you have something that you are dying to know as we are going through the class. The other option that you can do is you can send a message in the chat box. So I just sent a message through the chat to everyone. You should see a little uh, red pop up of some sort that tells you there's a new message. If you click on that, it'll open the chat box for you. So you can feel free to type to us there and I will field your questions, um, interrupt Chef Amber if we need to interrupt her at any moment. Um, your muting and unmuting should be some, probably in your lower left-hand corner of your screen, looks like a little microphone. You can click it and unclick it to mute and unmute yourself. Um, if you want to show us your video, that's great. If not, that's okay too. I would like to start off before I turn it over to Chef Amber and just find out, is anybody actually cooking along with us this morning and preparing the recipes now? All right, we'll assume that you're going to be doing it later, um, which is great too. I'm, uh, Amber's going to talk about um, some of the things with these recipes that we came up with in terms of things that can be prepared in advance, et cetera. So I am gonna go ahead and turn it over to Chef Amber. Let me go ahead and spotlight her video. Now you should be able to see Chef Amber nice and big on your screen. If for some reason you can't, you're gonna wanna go ahead and set your view to the speaker view. Um, you can do that either in the upper right-hand corner of your screen on a computer or through your iPad or um, tablet, you can swipe one way or the other to change the view. All right, Chef Amber, let's get this Thanksgiving party started. Uh, good morning, I'm really excited. Thanksgiving's my favorite holiday and this year I, that means I get to eat it for an extra week with um, getting to make this up today. So I'm really happy about these recipes. Um, today we're going to be working a little bit mixed up from how we usually do. We'll be trying to get that um, spaghetti squash in the oven um, first, that way we're really trying to focus on how we're going to utilize our oven in an efficient way, right? When we come for Thanksgiving or when it comes to Thanksgiving, a lot of things are using up the oven. So we want to try to find a way that we can do that strategically. Um, and so hopefully I'll be able to have all the things done um, how they are supposed to do. So um, first thing, if you haven't, if you are cooking along, please preheat your oven to 400 um, because we'll take a look at that spaghetti squash. Additionally, we are going to do things like grease or casserole pan. I've already made my cornbread um, yesterday. We used that recipe from last ARP class on how to make those cornbread muffins. And I'm gonna be using that exact same recipe to make this um, dressing. You could use any store-bought, oh, good to go. You can have any store-bought bread mix, or if you are looking just to have normal bread, you can really use the same type of cooking process. You're not limited to cornbread. Um, I know my family really likes Jif cornbread, and I'm not going to convince them another way, but it's really handling how to go from there. Okay, so um, for our conversation, first we're going to start with some spaghetti squash. As we talked about last time, spaghetti squash has a really mild flavor. Um, it is going to pull apart like spaghetti um, in strands. And then if we roast it, and depending on how we pull it, we can have those longer strands. Um, it has a very mild flavor as opposed to other squashes. I really love to keep random squashes on hand, similar to potatoes, because it's a really great thing to keep on the counter or in the fridge on the counter person for a couple weeks, couple months. Um, and it's fine and it'll still be good to go. This one we bought uh, at least a few weeks ago. So I'm not too concerned about it. Um, the way we're going to handle this, as we always do, is we want to be thinking about what is the flattest of all the surfaces. So it happens to be how it grows usually. And then I'm going to cut it in half lengthwise. Um, remembering that when we're holding our chef knife, we're holding it between our thumb and our first finger. And you're gonna have a little bit of leverage. We wanna make sure that it's not gonna fall out from under us. 
Another note I want to make is I have washed mine. Um, even though we're not going to eat the skin, um, rinsing is really important because the dirt on the outside will go into the inside from your knife. So I'm just going to pick a spot in the center. I'm really hoping it's cooperative, unlike that watermelon from a few months ago. And then I promise, I know how to do it. And then you can crack it in half. It looks very similar to um, in, insides of like a pumpkin. So we'll just scoop all of that out. So Amber, I know last month we talked about the difference between winter and summer squash, and I think it's a good reminder and for anybody who maybe missed that class, but you know, we would consider spaghetti squash a winter squash because it does have that tough, hard exterior skin that is not edible. Unlike, you know, a summer squash, like a zucchini or the yellow squash, where you can eat the entire skin. Now that doesn't always mean that every winter squash has an inedible skin because there are some varieties like the acorn or the delicata where we can actually roast those up and eat the whole entire thing besides the, the seeds, of course. But um, you could see when she was cutting it, it's a pretty tough little bugger there that she's got to get her knife through. <laughs> I also like to note that the seeds inside of all of our squashes are butternut squashes, spaghetti squashes. You can take those and you can roast them just like we do pumpkin seeds and add a really nice crunch to any of your dishes, but also we're adding in that little bit of extra fiber and in such also an extra Mediterranean diet point. So we're really able to utilize all the parts. I think I underestimated how hard it was going to be to scoop all that out in a attractive manner. Well, and sometimes I want to mention here because I've often, I remember like one of the first times I ever did this with a, with a spaghetti squash, I was worried at this point that I was taking out too much of the flesh. You mm. see how she's kind of taking some, some parts out that look like that spaghetti, you know, thin kind of texture. That's okay though. You want to do what she's doing there where you get it, you know, just down to the solid squash, all that inner part can go before it gets roasted. Right. And then it does have a very similar stickiness as butternut squash on your hands. You can, you can just be mindful of where you're putting it. Important spot about the roasting. If we roast it face side up like this, then it's gonna take longer. It's not, nothing's wrong with it. But what we'll do is we'll put it side down so it's steaming at the same time really utilizing that cooking process so looking at the recipe i'm going to rub the inside with about one teaspoon of oil and then put on some salt amber i'm just curious i don't think that you and i ever talked about this but have you ever done your spaghetti squash cooking in the microwave by any chance Oh, I haven't. I have learned that I've underutilized the <laughs> microwave. Every time you talk to me about things that Chef Mike is good for, I'm like, oh. <laughs> I just ask because I have done it in the past. It's been a long time ago. I feel like for me, it didn't work as, I didn't feel as confident with it. I don't know. You would think it would be easier, but I will say this doesn't take a long time really. And it's very hands-off, you know, once you get it in the oven, you're just really letting it sit there. Um, so I really like the roasting. I think it also gives it a nicer flavor because you do get a little bit of caramelization um, on the surface in particular, where you have that bottom surface contact with the pan. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know, maybe if anybody has any comments on this, if maybe someone else has used the microwave. I know Christina's asking, could we do this on the stovetop some way as well? Ah, uh, I don't know about that. I think it would, I okay. think it's not gonna work because I think you need to be able to have that steam element. I mean, maybe if you put it inside some kind of device, you know, a pan with a lid that you could really steam it. But I think the oven, to me, the oven is the best way. I don't know. Cut it where, once I scoop it from here, cut it in half. So you have these like half moon shapes. Mm -hmm. And I've done those flat like this and it cooks not efficiently, but it cooks. I would bet that if you did that same technique, you could probably do it on the stove 
top, but I think I would peel it if I were really very similar how I'd peel a butternut squash if I was trying to do that. I yeah, don't that's, think it, that skin is so hard to peel on the spaghetti. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, well, we're going to show you oven method, very easy. I'm just going to take out my cast iron because that thing lives in the stove and I forgot. <laughs> I always do that too. And then I go to pull it out and it's very hot. I try to convince myself that if I leave it in the oven um, and I forget about it, it's just like re-seasoning it every yeah. time it heats up and it makes me feel less, uh, makes me feel like there's an intent for it. Okay, so that's gonna go in the oven. I'm gonna set a timer for 30 minutes. I'm not usually, as y'all know, big fan of a timer, but we also know that I've been forgetting everything. So we'll go ahead and do that. And then I can put that recipe to the side. For our, um, we're gonna go into a PowerPoint situation. And so we can talk about a little bit of our talking points for Ask the Chef. We're gonna talk a little bit about our poultry seasoning. We're gonna talk about um, some ticks and tricks. And then I also heard that there's a decent amount of questions about brining. So we're gonna go ahead and discuss that as well. So. Um, Amber, are you seeing the right thing on my screen right now? I, I see the perfect thing. Okay. Perfect. Guys, I made this PowerPoint and I hope it is aesthetically pleasing. I'm working on <laughs> Heather uh, to competing with the one that Heather made last time. So hopefully it works through. Okay, so next slide, we're going to be talking about our poultry seasoning. So poultry seasoning as a whole, um, we have a recipe, which Heather will share a link on that main um, recipe page that we talk about. But the overall idea is that poultry seasoning's purpose um, is to be a really, comp not complicated, but it's gonna be blending the savory herbs with our sweet herbs like nutmeg to find, add this deeper complexity to our usually protein, right? In the name po poultry, but you can put it on vegetables, you can put it on red meats, you can put it on fish. It's really just trying to add and play on all these different types of herbs. Now in general, this is gonna be a salt-free seasoning blend that you can buy. You can make it um, like we're sharing this um, in this handout. I've made mine yesterday. Now I like to note a couple things. First off, when you buy it, it's completely ground and it should be ground, right? So I don't know if you can make out, it's a, I didn't, wasn't smart with a glass container, but um, it's a very soft grind situation. I made this in my mortal and pestle because I don't buy things like ground sage or ground marjoram. So I had to make this type of blend. You could do the same thing in a spice grinder or coffee grinder. Um, those aren't necessarily always things that people have on hand. So for this type of blend, we're really trying to take that nice herby flavor. If you think about it, sage and thyme or thing, rosemary, things that we usually are putting into our um, stuffing or, in, or dressing um, and then into things like our turkey. So it's not, it doesn't make, it's not too disjointed as a flavor profile. The other things though, like marjoram, marjoram has a very similar flavor to oregano. You can substitute for oregano in this recipe. I would not recommend, and honestly, I would not, I'd say please don't substitute any of these other herbs because it really is supposed to be playing off of each other. And then the nutmeg adds this really nice sweetness at the end. As far as making your own, um, it's really nice because we're always talking about having your different herbs and trying to make a blend and make it more interesting, right? You could also, if you were really feeling it, you could just shake these herbs onto your dish or at least a um, some of them, or um, you can try to just do the ones that you have on hand, the ones that you like. All said and done, would I necessarily always diff, like lean towards making this myself, like the taco seasoning or the Creole seasoning that we're always using? That's an individual preference. Um, for myself, no, um, I use it so infrequently and I use things like marjoram so infrequently that it's not worth buying a bottle and buying a bottle of all these things if you're not already using them. Something like this, even marjoram was something we had to buy at the teaching kitchen because it's not something we readily use. So you're really just thinking about if you have it on hand, yeah, it's a great option. If you don't, maybe don't do it. You can buy a little container. It's up to you. I'm not gonna say yay or nay either way. Um, 
Okay, so now, <laughs> uh, now we can talk a little bit about our um, how to try to make the holidays more stress free um, and trying to make these things that we're really doing ourselves a favor. Um, I'm always talking about how, like, how can I make things easier for my future self? Um, and so for that, we're really trying to think about ways that we can do our future selves a favor, right? Um, how can we find ways for, for example, doing a semi-homemade? Uh, it's always okay. And I do it. Heather and I are always talking about how we can just buy a pre-bag of um, cut cabbage mix and use that in our salad or um, pre-cut greens or pre-cut kale. You do, there's no cheats in doing that. Um, it's really supposed to be helping you along the way. And it's unrealistic to think that you're going to make everything on the Thanksgiving table. Um, we want to be thinking more about how we can buy pre-chopped or mixed things or um, things that are frozen items and then just add some pizzazz to that to make it a more interesting dish. We can really be doing that with things like our sides. Um, and then we're also thinking about how we can help ourselves in the future. Things that we're making today, for example, we could pre, like I am adding a few things to our dish today I made yesterday, but we could also be thinking about ways that we could pre-make our appetizer and freeze it. We're gonna be doing some of that for our December class, but we also could be pre-making this fennel dish ahead of time and just reheating it day of, or for this cornbread dressing, we could be making it and mixing it together, cook it, put it in the fridge and then reheat it the day of, um, as well as things like that for our side. We can really be looking at how we're per cooking. And this is something that I'm also doing when I'm meal prepping. I'm trying to think, how can I do myself a favor get it pretty set, and then I can just pop it in the oven the day of, or when I get home from work or whatever it may be, um, to save some time and save some dishes, right? For example, today, I only have one large saute pan, so I had to borrow one from work. That's really a thing that people in general are doing, right? You have to think about what types of dishes that you have and what things you have on hand, as well as what type of equipment you can use to cook, which is also the next point, making things that don't necessarily require the oven. We're trying to think about things that we've been making over the course of these classes, but in general, ways that we could be sauteing or cooking in a stove or broiling, or we could serve it cold. That's my favorite thing, adding cold dishes. Um, or if we could grill or air fry or use some type of instant cooker. So, or Heather was mentioning to me yesterday that there's a decent amount of dishes that her family does that then can just keep hot in the crock pot. So there's definitely ways that we could do that in other ways. And my goal is always to avoid the oven because the main things that are most important to me, that turkey, the maybe you're making a ham or a roast or something like that, as well as the stuffing, those are, those are like non-negotiables. They need that oven time. Um, and then if by doing these other cooking techniques, we're also adding in a lot of varieties of textures. If we're always doing the exact same cooking technique, then it's not going to add as much depth. So if we're able to add some grill marks or add some char, or add some um, saute in another way, then that's going to be able to give us ways that we can have a lot more variety on our plate and still keep the staples what they are. Um, and then I guess that means I'm going to skip to the last bullet on that note, just because it makes sense. Is With that, we're really trying to add different textures, different colors. Um, and what I'm always encouraging someone, if you're bringing it to an event or you're, someone's coming to your house and like, what can I bring? Um, it's really something that we could say to them to make something that doesn't have that mushy texture that the main things that we eat on Thanksgiving, like that stuffing, like the potatoes that are all just pretty mushy um, and kind of like plain in color. So if we can add more texture and we're not, we're not as heavy when we're eating, um, then it can add a lot more to our plates and make it look more appetizing. Um, which means I will back up a little bit, just one thing for the appetizer. I know how they're not going very quick, um, is the appetizers. They're really meant for picking. Um, and they're really meant for ways that we're able to eat and graze as we're going through the the couple hours before we eat, 
Um, I know that I have definitely been um, someone who makes these really, you know, elaborate appetizers and then everybody's full and then they don't eat the meal and they're not appreciating all that hard work that you put into. So if we're able to think about ways that we can make these appetizers, which is going to be the main theme of our December class, is really what can we do that our guests can feel um, satiated and have a little bit here and there without using necessarily all the oven time but also so that way our guests aren't full. Okay, so my main excitement for this situation is brining. That's our next slide. It's really trying to figure out what's the deal with wet brining, with dry brining, should we brine um, or not? And this is, I'm gonna give you a spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. There's no correct answer on if you should or shouldn't. Um, so keep that in mind as we're going through this isn't just applying to turkeys, this is applying to all varieties of um, protein options. So for brining, for wet brining, we are, the whole definition of brining is really, we're submerging some type of food product, which is usually a protein, in a salt-based water solution. This is, the purpose of it is we're using osmosis to, um, which is very similar to pickling, to bring that salty, flavorful liquid into our food product. Um, so that way it's going to absorb all the flavors that you have in the liquid around it. Um, that way it's going to be more tasty, but it's also going to appear more tender because that salty liquid is going to be partially cooking and, and breaking down the protein as it's going. Um, and this brine can be very, very strong. I brined with some students last month and it's so strong that the peppercorns and the herbs I was putting in the brine were embedded into our meat. Like it's really a very powerful thing that we are doing naturally that we can utilize to the best of our abilities. Um, some brines do include sugar. The whole idea is that it's gonna help buffer how much salt is absorbed um, into that protein or into that food item. But in general, um, it's an individual choice. So some flavor elements that are really important for brining um, in general are, my favorites are always some fresh herbs, um, rosemary, thyme, oregano, parsley, um, as well as things like bay leaves and peppercorns and garlic. Um, you can also do things like dried peppers if you wanna make it spicy. We can add onion or shallot if we want to add a little bit more of that type of flavor. We could do things like anise or cinnamon stick or clove if we're going for a sweeter. So this isn't really reserved for just a savory technique. Um, the most important thing I like to notice though, or sorry, note, is that it can be citrus rind. It can't be citrus. A lot of the, while I was looking through brines on the internet, just to get an idea of what's out there, most of them do recommend things like whole lemon. Um, we don't want that because the acid in citrus is really what is used in marinating. So we're doing, if we're marinating, which is a great play off of what Miss Lynette is asking right now, marinades are oil and acid based um, versus a salt solution like brines. And so anytime we add an acid and a salt together, they're going to work against each other. Um, and they're going to make the meat tougher. So you'll see this when people add um, salt to a marinade, which you shouldn't, or an acid to a brine, which you shouldn't, or if they, you'll see things like if someone makes a barbecue sauce and like tries to soak their meat for an extended period of time, that's my favorite because they'll be like, I put this in here for like two days and it's super tough. And I'm like, yeah, you put sugar, salt, and acid, you know, you put that vinegar usually. And so you're just making that meat tougher the longer it sits there. Um, and so we're really trying to be, it, this is really a situation where more is not more. We want to be really thinking about what type of angle we're trying to do. And then after our meat's done brining, we can add some acid. Or after our meat's done marinating, we can then add salt. Some basic ideas of what, like, of what a wet brine is. Um, traditionally, it's a 6.25% salt solution. I know it sounds super hyper specific, but one cup to one gallon um, of a salt to water ratio. 
that sounds really, really salty, right? Um, traditionally, you can go between five and 10% salt. So that meaning that if we're going as low as 5% salt solution, that's really a 0.8 cup. So just over three fourths of a cup of salt per um, gallon of water. You cannot go down to three fourths of a cup. This is not the point where we're trying to cut down our salt, mainly for a few reasons. All of that salt's not going to be absorbed into our protein, so we're not really worried about it. But we also need to make sure that if you put too little or too much, it doesn't work. Uh, the meat won't absorb it. So you have to get that sweet spot, which is why we usually say about 6.25%. Things like 10% solution make it really, really, really salty um, would be things like a super quick brine, like on fish for less than 30 minutes, it would be done. So we're really trying to think about where we're at and how to make sure that we're not going too low. Um, if we are adding sugar to a brine, you're doing equal parts salt and sugar. Again, if we're thinking about are how much of, of a um, salt and sugar situation. You can do a little bit less sugar, but we only have so much um, dilution or um, that we can be working with. So we wanna be thinking about trying to keep it pretty even if we're gonna use this technique. Um, the other thing about this, Brian, which can make it a little bit harder is you have to mix the salt and sugar and or if you wanna include sugar into the brine liquid so that way it fully dissolves, which we do have a saturation point. You can only dissolve so much, so we can't get too crazy, um, is you have to keep adding that in and making sure it's covered. We cannot be mixing while the protein's in the container because then we don't fully dissolve that salt and sugar. So it can add a little bit of challenge. Um, for the brining process, we are, oh, yeah, you can add any types of herbs and spices you have and then really thinking about for the brine, um, we're looking about two to three hours per inch. So Heather's right for the next slide, how to brine. The whole idea is wet brining is a 12 to 24 hour process. So 24 hour process for larger pieces, especially like our whole turkey. So you're gonna be having to plan the day before to submerge that. Um, you can, I feel closer to 12 hours for those chickens, um, depending on how big your other meats are. Um, like our pork shoulder or roast, you're really just thinking about that two to three hours per inch of it. Um, so there's a decent amount of science that that's happening. For smaller pieces, for our breast, for our wing, for our chops, this could be land chops, pork chops. Um, so any type of animal protein really works well for this. That's more of four to eight, four to eight hours. So that's the day of situation. Um, if we go too long, then our meat gets, uh, it's called denaturing, which just means it's gonna get really tough, but it's also gonna look partially cooked it creates this really interesting um, rubberiness, but in the way that when you bite into it, it breaks. I don't recommend it. It's very um, salty, but also feels really weird in your mouth. Um, so for reducing our saltiness in our brine, uh, especially if you left it in for a little too long or you're not sure if you left it in too long, I generally recommend, um, we say rinse it, in water if it's the amount of time that you wanted. But if you're nervous about how salty it is, I recommend dumping out the brine or just removing it for the brine in the meantime, submerging it and soaking it in some water, normal tap water, uh, discard that water, maybe do it again. This is a very similar technique to if you're doing like salt fish and trying to get that salt out of there and rehydrate it. And then once we're done, we wanna pat that meat dry um, and then cook it as desired. This cooking process will take a lot less time, much less time. So maybe that's a pro if you want your turkey to take less time in the oven um, because that salt has already tenderized it and because the proteins are already so relaxed that they just cook really quickly um, in that process versus unbrined. Um, some things that we wanna be considering that we should not be doing. I know this slide is a little confusing. So. We should not be letting the protein soak for longer than advised. As I mentioned, it gets a really weird texture and it's not very palatable as well as being too salty. Um, we don't want to add that too much or too little amount of salt um, as well as that acid, which I feel like I went really the thorough on those first three bullets. Um, we do not want to skip the rinse process. If you don't rinse it, there's gonna be a lot of salt on the outside as well as once you start cooking it, a lot more water is gonna come out of it. Again, osmosis is just that way. 
Um, we can't, don't want to cook it while it's still wet because it's not going to get that color on it. Like we do dry meats. That's a rule in as a whole for proteins. You just want to make sure they're pretty dry. So that way you can get some good color on there, especially if you have skin, uh, like the skin on the bird of a chicken. We do not want to be having that be really rubbery and wet. Um, we don't want to be brining on the counter. So we want to be thinking about that time and temperature danger zone that we're always talking about. You need to be super smart and super clean about avoiding cross-contamination, especially when we're working with our, um, with our birds. So to avoid bacteria and avoid um, foodborne illness, the worst thing is a foodborne uh, pathogen outbreak right at our Thanksgiving. Um, so we want to be thinking about making sure that it's in proper cooling. Usually wet brines are either wet brine turkeys, especially are either kept in the fridge or people will keep them in a cooler in like an ice chest. You could do that for something that's going to be only about a day. I wouldn't recommend it for something that was going to be longer. Um, and we don't want to save the brine. The brine is going to be filled with the bacteria of that animal protein, but it's also going to be really thriving in that environment if there's that sugar. So if you're going to do the exact same protein again for a short period of time, yes, you could take out your chicken, add in a new one. Um, but in general, we don't want to keep the brine. We want to be straining that out, getting rid of it. Um, you can't keep brine for longer than five days just because of that, um, how quickly microbes grow in there. Um, and if you're going to be trying to brine a vegetable, you have to do that before we brine our protein. So that way it doesn't get, um, so that way it doesn't get really weird in there, but also so that way our vegetables are getting cooked to a lower temperature and then we can have that food borne illness again. Um, excellent. So here's the thing about dry brining. Um, everybody calls it dry brining. It's not, it's not what it's called at all. It's the traditional technique of curing. Curing meats, which you'll see, even see with things like lox, is we're sum, submerging that into a salt or sugar and it's pulling out that water content. Um, something like this, we're really trying to think about how we can make a dry salt mixture to cover that meat. Um, the main things that are important about dry brining um, it's very similar to wet brining. There's just no water. There's also no whole herbs. So you do, if you are going to use herbs, you have to cut them very fine. Um, but more importantly, it takes an excess, like a lot longer time. It's uh, two to three days to complete based on the size. If you're doing a turkey, it is recommended three days of dry brining. When we're dry brining, we are some covering it completely in plastic. You put everything on, cut it, cover in plastic wrap and we're putting it in the fridge. Um, so it's going to take up a decent amount of space. Um, if it's cooked before it's ready, it will just get really dry in the cooking process, as well as um, we want to make sure that we're doing things like um, wiping off the drying mixture before we cook it, because otherwise you will literally have chunks of salt in your cooking process. Um, so the basic dry brine, the idea is for every five pounds of meat, we're doing a, hmm, I don't think your slide changed too. Heather, do you mind moving it over? Thank you. Um, so for every five pounds of meat, we're doing one tablespoon, one tablespoon of salt and then half a teaspoon each of, of, or total of some type of herd mixture and then some black pepper. Um, most commonly it's about a 10 to one ratio of salt to spices. If we're thinking about how much of those spices we're gonna be adding in. Um, and then for this, we're really thinking about for um, things like we could add sugar, but because it's gonna stay on the bird, things like brown sugar would make it a crispier, more molasses -y flavor. Um, you do need to make sure you have enough mixture to fully coat the protein. You want it on decently thick. Um, you do have to make that blend before you put it on the bird. So it's, or whatever thing you're going to be cooking in it. So you are going to need to be thinking about how we can, um, make enough of this mixture ahead of time for the, in general, we recommend dried herbs, which is fine because it's sitting for so long. It will get that flavor. You can use freshly chopped herbs as well. I wouldn't generally recommend that just because they're going to brown pretty quick um, if you're going to be leaving it on for three days. 
but you can use a lot of dried spices. In this situation, they need to be ground or very small in order to have it on there. So something like our poultry seasoning blend would be excellent to mix with salt to rub on the outside of our bird. Um, for this, we want to be, as I mentioned, we are brining the refrigerator. You can't do it in a cooler because of how long you're doing it. It has to be covered tightly. Otherwise, if you don't have your bird covered or whatever protein you're doing, um, if it's not covered, it's go the salt on it's going to be absorbing the moisture from the refrigerator as well as the flavor of the refrigerator. Um, and then it's not going to actually do a brine or curing technique. Um, there will be some liquid that accumulates. So usually people recommend putting it on top of some type of grate over a container that can hold liquid. Um, so that way that liquid can be um, dumped out. Okay, um, so what should you choose? Uh, so in general, let's do a comparison for wet versus dry brine. Wet brines take much less time. Dry brines, decent amount of time. Um, that's a commitment. I'm not a planner, so I know I will not be able to do a dry brine, especially on a bird, but maybe I could dry brine things like a pork chop or a steak um, during the week. That's a really good technique, especially if the meat's starting to turn, uh, like go bad. Um, this is something that's happening in restaurants, um, is once a meat's starting to head out, you put it in some type of brine or cure so that way it, or marinate, so that way it, it lasts longer. Um, both of them make it really tender and will infuse that spike, that flavoring. Um, we do need to think about how much space it's going to take up in our refrigerator and for how long. But the main comparison, though, is you need a big enough container for the wet brine. So something like a stock pot is a really great option um, to keep it in or um, some type of, you could do a, a gallon bag or I guess two to five, 10 gallon bags. I don't know. You could do some type of plastic in that way um, if you wanted to submerge it. Um, it's going to have a much more intense flavor than the dry brine. As opposed to the dry brine, it's going to take up a decent amount of space, but it's not going to be very wet. It's usually looked upon as less messy. Um, and it's going to provide a crispier skin because it wasn't waterlogged. So that's something to look into. Either way, your protein will cook a lot quicker brined versus not brining at all. Um, but that will be said, what if you don't wanna brine? That's cool, um, I'm not gonna brine my turkey. I like brining things all the time. I like to do things like pork chops and chickens. However, maybe if you're making this for the first time, your first time brining is not gonna be on one of the most stressful cooking days of the year. And that's fine. Um, you don't need to be making your you don't need to brine to make a really delicious, really tasty protein. So if we do things like we could try brining a different day, try something smaller, maybe you have a smaller container that you could be putting it in. Um, but for in general, for um, things like brining, it takes planning. So if you're going to do it, you need to know ahead of time, especially if you're getting a turkey that's going to take two to three days to defrost. So that'd be something you'd have to decide right now if you're gonna be brining um, for Thanksgiving. The other side of it, it does add a lot of really bold flavors. So if you are good at brining or you're comfortable brining, I say do it. It's a great, makes a really great food product at the end, at the end of the day. Um, for our day of turkey, my recommendation, Heather and I were talking about it yesterday. Um, <clears throat> she makes what we, call in the culinary world a compound butter, which is literally just taking butter, adding your spices, adding your salt, et cetera, into it, mixing it together. Um, I do the exact same thing, but I'm lazy. So I take butter, my spices and my salt, and I add them all in separately. Um, but either way, the idea is that we want to loosen the skin between the skin and the meat um, that kind of see through. It's called the fascia but it's what connects the skin to our meat. If we can separate that, we wanna be shoving all that flavor in between because we want that flavor to go to the meat. But also by doing that, that you can do oil if you want, but that butter is going to help keep it really moist in there. And the skin's gonna keep it really contained, very similar how plastic wrap would keep um, the flavor contained for the dry brine. And then we want that to be pretty covered so you can put it in between the thighs, in the breast, skin, et cetera. And then, <clears throat> then roast it. Usually we wanna recommend covering it in foil to roast it. So that way it gets a good temp before removing that and getting crispy on the outside. You can always add some additional flavor onto the skin if you so choose. All right, 
that's the end of my spiel. Um, you're not done listening to me though, because you still signed up for a decent amount of time. So we're going to go ahead and go into our, oh wait, does anybody have any questions? Does that make sense? Amber, we do have a couple things that came up in the chat, but I'm going to be, I'm, I want you to keep going with what you're doing. I'm going to be sharing some information about um, injectors. You know, you can get those things where you like, it's like a little syringe that you inject the meat with. I'm going to share some information. I was just reading about that for people who are okay. asking. Um, yeah, let's, let's keep it going. I'm excited to see the next recipe. Yeah, I definitely feel like uh, I'm going to take out my spaghetti squash and see if it's good to go. Injectors are a great option, especially if you're going to be using that buttery liquid. I wouldn't do something like the brine, though, because then you're inserting more salt into something that's already so salty that you might make it impalatable. Yeah, this site that I just shared has a really has really good information and it kind of compares your different processes of either a brine, a rub, or the marinade injection. So you have definitely some options. And yeah, as Amber said, I have brined in the past. I have ten. I've done the dry method, um, just because at my parents' house where I've done this before, I don't have a container big enough um, to fit the turkey and the brine. I will say. I don't know that I personally feel it's worth all the effort. Um, and so I think this year, like Amber, I'm probably going to skip it. And I'm probably just going to do my buttery, herby rub down. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I feel like it's really meant for planners. And I'm always envious of planners because they seem like they have it really together. Um, I feel, like to think my food still tastes good, but I feel like it tastes a little, little panicked on Thanksgiving, especially. Um, okay, so my so the squash is ready. It's yes, it's I forked it. it. Um, we're always recommending that fork tender technique, which is a very scientific way of sticking a fork in something and seeing if it pierces it without um, any type of delay. So I'm gonna let that cool on the side. I'm gonna remove it from the pan though, so it can get cool because we are gonna want to be handling this very soon. Just give me one second. I strongly don't recommend touching it with your hand. But I worked really hard for those years of desensitization in my fingertips. Okay, let's pull over there. All right, so now that that's out, I'm gonna lower the temperature of my oven to 350. And we can just go ahead and get going on the cornbread dressing. Now, I definitely grew up in the North and I had never heard anyone refer to this item as dressing before. Um, we called everything stuffing. And so I had to do some Googling to compare these. And turns out the only difference is that stuffing is stuffed in your bird, which makes a lot of sense. And then the dressing is just um, keeping it on the side. So makes sense in general. For mine, I used that cornbread recipe yesterday. And then once I was done, I let it cool a little bit and then crumbled it. And so that way it gets pretty stale. If you did not have, if you were not making it ahead of time, you're making it last minute, then you can just um, get that same type of technique inside the oven by putting it at 250 and it will dry out. It takes about 30 minutes doing that technique. It won't feel as dry as you want it to be while it's still hot because it will still evaporate some. So this is my cornbread. If I were going to be um, being like super good about it, if I made this ahead of time, because I could make this ahead of time, put it in a bowl and save it for the day of, I would put it in a bowl, but I'm just gonna leave it like this and hope for the best that I can get it into the pan once it's time. So. Okay, so for our cornbread dressing, we're trying to go a little bit more traditional with things like using our onion, our bell pepper, our celery. Um, really thinking about using that trinity, but we also added to the recipe on the side, which I know Heather's gonna send a link into the chat, 
But on the side, we also have a couple variations. So you have a sausage, pecan, and cranberry version, which is the one I'm gonna make. Um, so that way we have this nice umami, this meaty flavor um, with a little bit of the nutty and the sweet. But the other option is also this one that we're calling a Creole shrimp version, which we're using that Creole seasoning that we're using all the time in the classes. This one is said um, by our students, and I do think it's pretty unanimous. This one tastes a bit more of like a shrimp and grits flavored crunchy thing. Um, so for that, we're just going to be thinking about what type of flavor profile you're going to go to. I've never put shrimp into my stuffing or into my dressing. Miss Lynetta says that she does it. So really want to think about what type of angle that you're going with. So for the classic version, we're going to be dicing up all of our, 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 all of our veggies. So think about when we're going through our recipe, you know that we always have our how much of something and how we're going to be utilizing it. So for this one, we're going to be utilizing an onion. Um, so for my dice, don't want it to roll away too much. We are going to be cutting off the top. And then we can remove that loose thing. Then from there, we want to cut half the root, not half the onion. Then I can just peel back that outer skin. It's going to come my way pretty easily. Maybe not because I jinxed it. Anything that comes away with the skin wants to be there. So it's grown that way its whole life. Don't make it separate now. And then we can just go ahead and fill this all back. Heather, did we have anyone cooking along? I don't think so. I think maybe just Miss Lynetta is the only one cooking today. All right, Miss Lynetta, are you gonna be upset with me if I dice this pretty quickly? No, I bet. because I'm, I'm already diced. So. I was going to say, I think she works ahead. <laughs> Perfect. So um, we're going to be cutting this where we are not cutting the center. So we'll cut about two thirds of the way up. So I can just go ahead, make those cuts. I want to be th thoughtful about how close together my cuts are. So I'll determine how big of a dice I have. Turn to the side, make a claw. I'm using my thumb and pinky on the sides to pinch it together. Slowly move across the cutting board. I'm always moving my knife towards the pr product, not the reverse, because I don't want to put my fingers towards a sharp object. Heather, if there were any questions in the chat or anything I missed that you know of, this would be a great time to insert it because I'm also going to slice up my onion for the fennel. So I don't gotcha. have to double that. Um, no, not really. I was just sharing some information. I put a little more details in the chat about what I do for the herb butter rub on the turkey. Uh, to be honest, I don't measure anything. Mm, you know, it's I, I start with a stick of butter and just go from there. You know, I eyeball how much herbs to put in. But I mean, you can't go wrong with more herbs, more garlic. You know, a stick of butter should do you for a decent sized turkey. Amber said she usually does more like two sticks of butter. <laughs> I will say too, I have definitely done it with oil. I've done a chicken that way where I used olive oil and did the same thing. So just chopped up the herbs, chopped up the garlic. In that, in the time I did that, I actually included like red pepper flakes to make it a little bit spicy. And it was like rosemary, red pepper flakes, garlic. And then, you know, you do the same method just with the oil. So you just give it a nice rub down, get it all coated on the outside. Like Amber said, get it stuffed in between the layers of the skin and the meat as much as you can. And, you know, you definitely need some salt. You don't go too crazy, but you, you do want to salt and pepper it too. You can also, I will say, I take it back. You don't need to put the salt and pepper in the butter mixture or in the oil mixture. I would do the, give it the full rub down and then just give it a sprinkling of salt and, a, you know, crack your pepper over the outside of the bird, then throw it in the oven. Now, I also do the opposite of amber. I start it uncovered. And I wait until it gets nice and brown. Then I loosely tent it with a piece of foil so that I, you know, don't want to get the skin too dark. So that way, hopefully the skin stays nice and perfect. The other thing I was asking people in the chat, and I hope some people will respond, was just to tell us about what they usually, what their family usually puts in their stuffing or dressing. Um, because I think it's interesting, you know, of course, we have the the question of whether people call it stuffing or dressing, but also everybody puts different stuff in, in there. So I was curious to see what, what people 
what people like the best or what's their, you know, family tradition. Amber, what did you usually have growing up? Um, sorry, I got a lot of tears right now. Um, honestly, if you want super duper honest, um, my dad's side makes stove top stuffing. Okay. So I'm going to go with nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and then my mom's side, my grandmother is from Italy and they make add all the gizzards and all the insides of our bird. Um, and then she goes and she buys extra, li like extra liver, extra turkey necks, extra, oh. extra, and okay. then it's really meaty and then add sausage. Okay. Okay. So I don't think it's the healthiest version, but it's very <laughs> delicious. And I think as a child, had I known what parts were in it, I wouldn't have been as delicious. But as an adult, when I buy that container of, liv of livers, when I make mine, I use chicken livers. And I'm sad the entire time I'm doing it. And then I'm like, I'm so glad I did that. <laughs> it's so delicious. Um, if only I could buy those pre-chopped. Okay. Yeah. I need to wipe my tears real quick. So. Okay. I will. I just want to share with you while you're wiping your te tears that Danny agrees with you and says stovetop all the way. What's funny to me is that as a kid, I never had stovetop at Thanksgiving, but I must have had it at some other point. And I used to then beg my mother to make it. I'd be like, mom, can't you please make that stovetop out of the box? And she would kind of get mad at me because she, she thought I liked it better than the real stuff. Yeah, it's definitely a different ex experience. It's like making your own mac and cheese versus like a box. You're like, sometimes you need that box just to like make you feel good. It's a different type of thing. Um, okay. I wanted to add that that's another way to make Thanksgiving easy. Um, and for those who did- That's true. <laughs> who did say they like to use stove begins with you p if you could figure out the rest if not email me and i'll tell you two boxes for three dollars which is very cheap about now so i saw it the other day well you know what that brings up a good point um that you could probably also take that and doctor it up a little you know you could take a any kind of packaged thing we were actually i was talking with some other dietitians last night on a call about sodium that we were having a meeting about. And we were talking about what people can do if they want to reduce their sodium. You know, a great tip is just, if you are going to use something that is pre-done, you can jazz it up a little bit, make it your own, you know, add a few extra things. Maybe you could kind of take the approach we're doing today with either the sausage and the cranberries and the pecans, or you could do like the shrimp and the uh, Creole seasoning. I think that would be really fun. All right, I'm moving All right, on. Amber, you're speed chopping that celery. I love it. Um, my eyes are still a little blurry. So I was like, I just need to get all this cutting done once. <laughs> um, I made the mistake of leaving my onions on the counter because I do think that those volatiles, those parts of it that burn your eyeballs hurt a little bit less when we have it in the fridge. But that's okay. I really, I feel like that's the only time I'm really gonna just like have that much of a, of a acceptable kitchen cry. So I'm gonna take it. Okay. I think that's good. Um, I'm not cutting my bell pepper because that's omitted in the sausage recipe. And then I already bought pre-chopped, pre-toasted pecans because it made it a lot easier. So then I guess I'm just going to go with my garlic. Now I'm going to need garlic in both recipes. So again, I'm going to do a crossover and just do both at the same time. Anytime I'm working with garlic, I'm really trying to always cut off the root first. That way I don't have to hit it as hard. So I need four for that, two for this one. Um, Amber, I think that's a really good point to make that if you are doing a lot of prep on Thanksgiving day or even the day before Thanksgiving, 
it's really smart if you can get all your recipes, have them all in front of you. And I mean, we will often take the, the whole step of actually writing out a prep list. And, you know, you don't always have to go to that extreme, but it can be really helpful. And so you can look at your recipes and say, okay, this one needs, a, you know, an onion chopped. This one needs a half an onion chopped, you know, figure out where there's overlap between what you're doing and do all your onion at once. Do all your garlic at once. Use those little, you know, mise en place bowls. Use any little cups or bowls you have laying around the kitchen. I do that often uh, for holidays like this, where I know I'm going to be using a lot of herbs. I just chop all of it at once throw it in little bowls. And then as I am actually doing that cooking process, you're, you're acting a lot like a restaurant chef at that point, because all your stuff is ready to go. And you are able to just grab, grab and go um, as needed. And I think it really helps to save you time and you don't, you don't end up like running around and going back and forth between tasks if you kind of streamline it. So I think it's a good tip that you're doing there of saying, okay, I'm going to get all my garlic for both of these recipes done at once. It's also something that you mentioned about the sh restaurant chef. No restaurant chef is cutting all these ingredients to order. There is somebody prepping it during the day and having it all pre-cut into little containers um, and then having it ready to go. So why not use that type of efficiency? Also, though, I really love tasks like this for those helpers that are maybe less than helpful, that are always around, right? that really want to be able to contribute. So the day before I'm gonna be like, all right, here's all these onions. I'm gonna need them diced or something like that. So that way um, you're, not able, you're not having to use and do them all yourself, but we can utilize those helpers and the helpers feel helpful, which I think is always so important. Okay, I think I might, might be done chopping. Well, I hope so. so I'm gonna heat a pan behind me and heat this pan going and I'm going to hope for the best on that one. So our container, you wanna have your container ready so that way once we're done, it's good to go. So I'm just gonna spray this ahead of time. That casserole pan too, I mean, I would say that's probably the smallest size pan you would want to do this recipe in. I know when we tested it using that pan, we got a pretty nice mounded top to it. Um, you could spread it out in a larger size casserole if you wanted to. I think that really speaks to like, if you want more surface area to get crispy on the top, you might want to spread it out more and have it be less thick. Um, that's a choice that you can make on your own. Absolutely. Depending on what you like. Um, Amber, give me one second. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I'm not ready. I don't have your other camera. Oh, no. I think your other camera got lost. Hold on. Let me look. I didn't notice it until just now. I'm sorry. I didn't give you a heads up. It's okay. I So I'm gonna, I'm just waiting for this to preheat. So it's going to be nice and hot. I always want my pan to be hot before I add anything to it. So that way, especially if there's any water, it's not absorbed in there. Always good to preheat that pan. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and add you on. All right, so now I've got... Is it sideways? Oh, no. Yes. One See, we get all this out of the way before the class so we don't have this happen. And then somehow we still have this happen. <laughs> okay. I feel like everybody has technical difficulties and it's a lot more acceptable in the age of everybody working from home. It's true. It's okay. true. So this is good to go. Use my handy dandy ARP measuring devices to make sure I have the proper amount of oil. And then I'm just gonna wait for that oil to get nice and hot before I add anything into it. Now, Amber, I know you're doing the sausage, pecan and cranberry version. If we were just doing the plain version, we would just start by sauteing our 
um, aromatics are trinity. But in this case, I think you're going to start with your sausage first, which is yeah. nice because then the sausage, you know, you get that brown bits on the pan and then you can kind of keep going from there, building layers and layers of flavor. Right. Thank and you. then if we were doing the shrimp, you would start with the shrimp first as well. Yeah, so important to make sure that we're good to go and that our protein that we fully cooked and we can utilize that flavor. Cool. So I'll start with my sausage then. And I want to break that down as much as I can, honestly. I support what you're doing. I feel like sausage, you just, and sometimes ground meat like that, you just got to break it up into little pieces with your hands. <laughs> like this stuff is sticky. Well, sometimes it's also really like compact and hard and it just needs a head, needs a head start. So now you're using breakfast sausage, correct? I'm using breakfast sausage because I want that nice sweetness. But if you wanted to, you could use a spicy sausage. Yeah, I think it would be interesting to try. I know breakfast sausage is so, kind of traditional. I think because it already has sage in it, and sage is sort of the, you know, Thanksgiving feels like the holiday uh, herb is sage. Lots of sage at the holidays. And it's also really nice because it keeps really well. It doesn't die as quickly. So it's harder, like between that and time, I think it lasts forever. Yeah, true. It's a good, I, I will say it's something I don't use year round. It's not something I use commonly in my cooking. I know. But it's so delicious and I don't think of it, but it could be a good thing to, you know, think about other times you might want to add some sage to your, to your meals or to your cooking. Definitely. And I want this to be as small as possible because I want it in every bite. Now we just used a small amount of sausage too. I think it's good. That's a good thing to point out. You know, we do create healthy recipes. That's really a big part of what we do, but we don't want people to feel like they can't have the things that they like or the things that they enjoy. So, you know, a little bit of sausage goes a long way. This recipe uses eight ounces, but we're going to feed at least 12 people with this dressing. So, you know, we're really stretching it and we're adding a lot of other yummy a little more healthful ingredients besides the sausage. I would thoroughly agree. In the meantime, I'm pulling out my pre mise en place ingredients over here on the side. So that way I have it at the ready. So you wanna make sure your pecans are small enough, very similar to the size and shape of our craisins and of our sausage. The eggs ready. Got my stock good to go. Oh no, I didn't fresh mince the veggie, uh, the herbs, but that's okay because I'm going to take out the sausage and start the onion process and then I have plenty of time to do so. Now in this recipe, we're doing a combination of the poultry seasoning as well as the um, Fresh herbs, you could do just fresh, you could do just poultry seasoning, it doesn't matter. It's just adding that extra depth of flavor. Okay, so I'm gonna take out that sausage. When I do so, I'm gonna turn off the heat of my pan so I don't burn myself. And I'm gonna try to leave that oil, that fattiness in the pan so it helps to cook my veggies. And then I get more of that sausage flavor in my veggies. Yeah, and so in this version, we did take out the bell pepper and replaced it with an apple instead um, to give it more of that sweet element. But if you really wanted to, you could include all of it. You know, you could keep the bell pepper and put the apple in. It wouldn't hurt. Um, we just felt like with this flavor profile, the apple would be a nice, a nice swap. And I know somebody, somebody was chatting with me. Who was it? 
someone just also said, oh, Christina. Yeah, Christina mentioned that she did, her family did apples in their stuffing. And then we had uh, Cynthia who shared with us that they do like a walnut and cranberry and sausage. So kind of similar to what we're doing today. What kind of apple are you using today, Amber? I'm with Gala. I really like the way the red color adds. Okay, yeah. Um, but you can go with any type of seasonal apple as well as you could go with any type of color or flavor. If you like it a little bit more tart, really just playing to whatever flavor profiles you like best. Yeah, I will say I do like the slightly sweeter apple in this. Nowadays too, we have so many of these varieties that are both, you know, sweet and crisp. Um, I know, you know, back in the day, of course, the everybody was putting, uh, what is it, Granny Smith, you know, you, the knowledge is always like, oh, when you're baking or doing anything with cooking, use the Granny Smith because it can hold up, it can stand up to the cooking, which is definitely true, but it also has that really tart flavor. So if you're looking for something a little sweeter, it's kind of nice that we have all these different varieties that we can get pretty easily nowadays. I like the Gala, I like the Fuji also, or like the Honeycrisp. Any type of apple that I want to eat raw is generally the type of apple I try to buy because then if I change my mind or it starts to go bad quicker than I would want, then I can just eat it and not waste it. Totally. You know, I think it's the same thing they say about wine, right? You know, people ask like, what kind of wine should I use in my cooking? And they always say, whatever wine you'd actually drink, <laughs> right. just use that and you'll be good to go. All right. So I got the onion going. I'm really trying to get a little bit of color action on that, but I know the recipe says to add that in at the same time as the other veggies, which is completely fine. I just really like to have a little extra onion action as far as the color is concerned. So I'll go ahead and. I think it also depends on how big your pan is too, right? You know, oh, yeah. if you have a really, really big pan, you have more room to add everything all at once versus if you have a smaller pan, it might be good to layer it. That's definitely a great point. I wish I was there to smell that sage right now. I bet it smells really good. Um, it, It's one of my, I think we, like you were saying, I'm like, I never use it. And then when I go to use it, I'm like, why don't I ever use this? It's so flavorful. Well, I have to share. Richard was saying that his, um, his mom was from Northern Italy and she had a sage plant in the garden growing up. So she put sage in just about like everything. And so whenever he uses it, it, you know, gives him all those good memories, which I think is so nice. And this is such a great time of year to think about that. You know, hopefully people are able to come together more this year than they were able to last year. And we can get back with our larger family groups and get back to having all of our lovely holiday memories and traditions. Right. Couldn't agree more. Okay. So instead of going. And then once I get a nice color on that, getting it brown, then I can go ahead and um, try to really mix everything together. Um, Heather. I'm definitely missing a spot. I mean, miss my step. I feel like I'm supposed to put the apple in the same time, right? Um, yeah, you can definitely put the apple in now. It just needs to get a little, so it doesn't need to be in there the whole time, but like, it's not going to hurt to have it in now. Yeah, uh, basically the idea is get all the veggies sauteed. I like to add the herbs and spices in and give them a little bit of like a quick toast before you get everything else in the pan. But then essentially it's just mix everything else together. Add your sausage back in, add your cornbread, get your mm -hmm. um, chicken stock. You do need to beat your eggs, Amber. I saw you still had your eggs Ooh. in the shell. Good call, good call. I'm here to remind you. I'm your little like angel on your shoulder here to okay, tell I you. I like to think that. Don't forget yeah. to beat your eggs. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like definitely notice that little insert when you're like, I like the apple and I'm like, oh, apple. <laughs> like, thanks for being subtle, but I'm going to out myself myself. <laughs> but that's okay because it's really something is as we're going through, not everything has to be done ahead of time. As you're, you have plenty of lulls in the cooking process that we have a few minutes 
but we can keep cutting or try to move through the process at the same time. Okay. Yeah. No. I know it usually says to whisk, but I gotta be honest, I really don't use whisk very often, but it will make it a lot more light and fluffy if you do. I agree though, a fork is totally fine, especially- It's really hard to not dirty more things than I want to wash. That's fair. All right. I'll let that keep going. I can add in my, I'm gonna add in my spices now before I have them ready to go. Mm -hmm. Oh, half or this. And I'm not going to measure my pepper. I'm just going to go ahead and grate it right over. I really love pepper mills because it does make add that nice extra crisp flavor. Amber, just to give you a time check, we are getting a little close to the end of our scheduled time. Um, the I know once you get this in, we don't have a whole, whole lot left to do. Yeah, I, I definitely realized that a little bit during the um, time leading up. I'm like, oh, yeah, definitely not going to be done on time. Okay, I'm going to add in my stock. It's going to take up all that flavor on the bottom. That's called the Fond, F-O-N-D. I call it flavor crystals because that concentrates flavor in the bottom of our pan. I'll give that a second to warm up. And then I'll just go ahead and add my sausage now. Because that sausage will help, because it's hot, it'll help get that liquid going. All right. In the meantime, it's almost done. I'll just start cutting up my fennel. So thing about fennel, they're massive. Um, if you get them with the tops, I'm not really too keen on the tops. What I like to do is strip some of them if they're really low. So that way I can use some, but not all. Amber, just so you know, I'm coming back just to your cutting board here so we can see the fennel up close. Fantastic. So this is called a fennel bowl. Um, these are fennel fronds, these leafy bits. Um, you could see in the store that it could also be labeled under anise. Um, anise is technically not the same thing at all, um, it's, but it can be mislabeled as such. Um, they're not interchangeable. Just, and then once I get that off, that's when I rinse it. So I can take off those extra prongs as well. And sometimes, Amber, when you get it at the store, it comes like you got it there with the fronds attached, but sometimes you're going to see it just as the bulb. Right. If I could buy it without, with just the bulb, honestly, I would. If, if I had the option between the two. Because the top, you can definitely utilize a lot of, but you can't use all of it. Yeah, I was going to say, the top, there's a lot of the top, so sometimes it can be difficult to find a way to use all of it up, but... So usually you'll buy it with it like really down to the bulb. I like to keep all this because I try to utilize as much as I can. So I'll cut that part off. Yeah, let's see. How do we attack this? What's the way to cut it? So I'm going to cut all of this off. And then take as much. All right. Then for the tops, I'm going to cut them on a bias so it's going to mimic the slices of the actual bowl. Okay. 
for the poll. Yeah, thinly sliced. All right. Just want to make sure that I'm like, sometimes I just go a little bit too far outside what the recipe says. I'm cutting on a bias so that way I can get those nice elongated cuts. Go with whatever your hand's comfortable holding. You don't need to go crazy. I have very little hands, so I can just usually hold a little bit less. Once it gets to the weird shapes, because we're already utilizing them, we don't need them all. Talk a little bit while you're chopping that up about the flavor of fennel. Sure. So fennel has a very licorice type flavor, very strong anise or licorice flavor when raw. You'll usually see it in a salad situation. I'm just gonna pull these back a little bit. So if I cut it in half, I can rinse out the dirt because there's inevitably always dirt in between the layers. Um, but so it has a very licorice flavor when raw. So usually a lot of people think they don't like it. When cooked, it has a much more mild flavor. It's gonna add a very different texture than what we're seeing on our normal Thanksgiving table. So my mixture is good to go over here, Heather. Okay. Am I missing anything important? No. Let me add. Let me add it back on, mm. so we don't miss anything. Okay. So we're adding. What are we doing now? Adding the cornbread and cornbread. And then after I add the cornbread, I'll fold in the eggs because I don't want it to be too hot because then I'll end up with like an egg drop soup type texture. Also, yeah, don't you don't want scrambled eggs in your dressing. It's not the goal. Definitely not. I will say last year I made an interesting dressing where I did a combination. It was half sourdough bread that I purchased a loaf at the store and then just sort of uh, roughly, you know, I cut it up, let it stale up a bit, cut it, let it stale some more. And then I did make a homemade cornbread uh, recipe, our cornbread recipe. And so I did a 50-50 blend, which was kind of interesting. It was nice because, you know, the cornbread's a little sweet. It's definitely got a different texture. Um, I think you can do so many different things with the stuffing. I've seen a lot of really interesting varieties, although I know my family would never go for something too out there. No, I definitely have to stay pretty close to home. Yeah, got to go stick pretty much to the like, usual flavors and don't go in anything. I mean, I think I saw one recently, it was like chorizo and Calabrian chilies. And I was like, oh, that sounds delicious, but maybe just like not for Thanksgiving day. Maybe, maybe on another day, we could do that one. <laughs> All right, and then I like to add that egg in at the last second. So that way it's already absorbed from most of the flavor and we don't have like really eggy bits and then really flavored bits separate. Somehow I think we froze. Yeah, your your other screen just died out on us, Amber. Perfect. It got overheated. Oh yeah, it happened. Let me just stick it in the fridge for a second. If you want, you could probably do that right on your cutting board. We can see it. We can see that view very well. Yeah. Hmm. Looks moist. Yeah, it's really wet. So I do have to give a slight spoiler. Um, oops. I have celiac, so I'm gluten-free. So this cornbread is a little bit less of an ideal of texture. Like it's a bit more than we'd bargain for in our normal cornbread. So I don't want you to look at it and be like, that, I never eat that. It's really. So you think yours is a little moister than when I made the other version because of the cornbread you used? Yeah. Okay. I will say, yeah, I mean, this recipe, just like any other dressing or stuffing, you know, you want to make sure that it you have enough liquid that it's moist, but obviously you want that crispy, crusty top to it, um, which is definitely the main reason I would say, I think most people don't put their stuffing inside of a turkey anymore these days. Number one, it doesn't cook evenly, but then you miss out on that nice crust, right? 
Um, this definitely works a lot better for that. And I will say if you did need a little extra um, oomph, like if your crust isn't getting really as brown as you want, a really quick little tip you can do is just to give it a spray with your nonstick cooking spray. Um, or if you have like a spray oil bottle, um, you can do a quick spray and then that'll help encourage additional browning. That's a great pro tip. So for these, I really just like to take one cut down the center so it's not too long and then just slice through. Amber, I'm gonna need to uh, run away for a very quick second. So you're on your own while you finish up your fennel chopping. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I'll be right back. Okay, so. I'm not sure if my okay, phone's not gonna be ready yet. So I can just finish cutting the rest of that fennel. And then I gotta be honest, when in general with fennel, I think a lot of people think it's gonna be a too intimidating of a flavor combo. You can make this flavor really on its own in general. Um, but for this recipe, I feel like we'll add a really nice crispness and texture to our Thanksgiving meal. And then it will add a very different flavor. So even if you don't have very much on your plate, it will really cleanse the palate as a whole, which I personally prefer. Okay. So I know you can't see it, but I am heating up my pan behind me. We'll figure out how to make this work, guys. Um, so I got this pan behind me. We're gonna heat up the onion and some oil. I think the recipe says, one tablespoon of oil. Same cooking process of just making sure it gets hot enough. And then it'll start sizzling once it's hot enough. So this will be a super quick process. First, drop in your onions. And then. Now, Amber, I know we talked about this yesterday and I see you are using the nonstick pan. Do you wanna maybe tell a little bit about that while you're getting ready to throw everything in? Yes, so I really love nonstick pans for a couple of reasons. One, um, because my cooking station is behind me, I'm not really watching it as much. So that can cause a lot of burning. So a nonstick pan, we can get nice and hot. We can forget about it a bit and it not really cause any type of problem, which is really nice. Um, additionally, you need less oil because there will be less sticking. So then when we go to do our um, cooking, we can get a lot of really great color on our veggies at a high heat without it sticking. Yeah, that's my favorite thing. I mean, I will say I have a pretty heavy duty nonstick uh, pan that I often use at home, but I think you can definitely, it's a little more forgiving. You know, you don't have to worry as much about the sticking or the burning. So like, I know for me, I like to crank the heat pretty high and get some really deep color, particularly, you know, certain things I'm doing. Um, I really love to do it. I know Amber, I talk, talk to you about this all the time, my shredded Brussels sprouts. I buy that bag of shredded Brussels sprouts at the store and I just throw it in a pan with like very little oil and let it get really, really brown and then let it sit, like don't stir it a lot. And then maybe finish it with just like a squeeze of lemon and some Parmesan kind of the same flavor components you're doing on this dish today, actually. Garlic, yeah. lemon, parm. Yeah, this flavor concept really works well for just about any type of vegetable. Yeah, I mean, you can roasted vegetable, sauteed vegetable, you know, a charred vegetable, even a steamed vegetable, you know, throw a little oil with some garlic, lemon, parsley, or, you know, uh, some other type of fine herb, and then Squeeze it, squeeze it with some lemon and grate a little fresh Parmesan. Now, Amber, have you heard, I wanna ask you something as you're doing this. So you're forking, you know, you're using your fork to scrape out all those little strands of the spaghetti squash. I just saw a video last night actually um, of a girl who was explaining that if you want your spaghetti squash to be longer strands, really more similar to spaghetti, the ones that you have there are going to be a little bit shorter. You know, that would be like if you broke your spaghetti in half before you put it in the boiling water. 
Um, if you want those really long strands, all you have to do is cut your squash in half the other way. So Amber cut it in half, you know, across the longest side, but if you cut it in half, so you have two little like squatty round cups, basically, apparently you will get a longer strand when you go to fork it out. I'd buy it. I know. I'd never heard of that before, but I thought, okay, that's interesting. I think for this dish we're doing today, we're not really trying to make it like spaghetti. So I don't think it's really necessary, but could be a tip if you are somebody who likes to use this vegetable more as a spaghetti-esque thing, you know, oftentimes that's people are eating this as like a pasta replacer or something where they're adding to their pasta, maybe using it to supplement. That's definitely the most important thing. I always try when I'm eating I don't want things to taste like what they're not. So for me, I want it to be a squash, but there's plenty of opportunities where we can be making it, where we want it to make that um, mimic of something like a spaghetti. Now in general, is it gonna be as filling as spaghetti? No. Is it gonna taste like it? Not really. So you have to decide if you're okay with that and let it be some type of modification in the middle. Yeah, I do like the idea of doing like a 50-50. Yeah. But I also really like using it this way as its own kind of thing for the side dish. I will say this dish is really, um, it's, you know, it's very low calorie. That's one of the main reasons people really try to do spaghetti squash, right? Like that's ultimately why people are a big fan of it. Um, it's very low calorie, which I will say, you know, when you're thinking of your Thanksgiving holiday table we often don't have a whole lot on there that is lower calorie or a little lighter you know it could be nice to incorporate something like this that is actually i mean and i will say for a half cup serving you get three grams of fiber so it's it's not it's gonna fill you up a little bit right it's definitely one of those things that i think you have to be able to be okay with it being um, something new to experience. So we could try it with a flavor profile you already know. So I think that's why a lot of people like it in that spaghetti application because it's something mimicking what they already know. Um, and that's something that Miss Lynette is always stressing to us is making sure that we're trying to do things that are familiar enough, but then a little bit outside the box. So that way everybody can get their needs met and their interests fulfilled um, by having a new ingredient like this. So with those onions and fennel, Amber, you're basically just letting them go and do their thing, letting them try to get some color, yeah. letting them soften up. You can um, switch to the stove pan. Okay. I didn't know it was back. Sorry. Let's see. Let me find it. I don't have it back, actually. I see it. Oh, there it is. There it is. It was hiding. <laughs> Okay, I got you. I got like you're you. gonna convince me it's get kicked off again. <laughs> Nobody sorry. gets the pan. I'm out. I quit. <laughs> okay, I see. It looks like it's getting a little bit of color on the edge. It's kind of softening up a bit. All right, and then what are you doing there? Is that the fennel fronds? This is the parsley. Oh, the parsley. Okay. I'm gonna use in conjunction with some of the fronds. If you have fronds, it's great. If you don't have them, you're not missing out in the recipe. Yeah. When I cut, I'm trying to ball it up and just make something really tight together. You probably noticed too, if you've never worked with this before, it looks a lot like dill. You know, it has the similar texture these fronds do, but it definitely has a, a licorice kind of flavor. And I will say, um, it can be really nice to bring, you know, do a dish with fennel that brings out the licorice flavor where you serve it raw. Oftentimes you might see it shaved really thinly and incorporated into like a salad. Um, and when you have it that way, you definitely taste more of that licorice. Whereas this way that we're doing it, where we let it get nice and caramelized, just like any other vegetable that you roast or caramelize, you know what that does. It brings out the natural sweetness. Um, and so that's what we're doing here today. Definitely. But I like the fronds because they add just a little tiny hint of that licorice. Uh, yeah, vibe. it's very similar to how you'd want to add like a little bit of maybe fresh and then cooked parsley or fresh and cooked herbs in general into your dish.
All right, okay. so we got lemon zest going on. Yeah, it's really important. I, I feel bad. I feel like I assume that people are really good at zesting. We had a class two weeks ago and the med student juiced it and he's like, how do I zest it? And I'm like, oh, you don't now. Um, so we want to zest it, but we want to be zesting uh, just the top of the skin. We don't want it to get white. Um, and then I give it a nice roll. So it's, um, it breaks a lot of those pulps and then I can use the rest of the juice directly. So you, do, you need to decide before you cut that lemon in half, are you zesting it? And if so, you need to zest it before you cut the lemon to juice it. And I feel like there's approximately no situations in my life that zest was a bad idea. I agree. I think if you're gonna use lemon or lime or orange or any citrus in a recipe, you're just going to amp up the flavor if you use the zest. So why not? Yeah. All right. More flavor equals delicious. I got some great color on this. It's almost completely cooked down. It does look like a good color. I was a little worried that I wouldn't have enough space in there. Get my salt and pepper at the go. All right. So. I'm going to, I feel really good. I think it's about pork tender. It, I do have that brown bit added in. The cooking process happened a lot quicker because of that non-stick pan. So, but so if we that. weren't using a non-stick amber, what would you recommend? What would be your, um, you know, if I don't have a non-stick pan and I need to use a stainless, do I need to go a little lower and slower in my cooking process probably? Yeah. I go a little lower and slower. If I didn't have a nonstick in this recipe, because I'm trying to get that nice color, I'd do cast iron would be a great option. Okay. Um, yeah. Then you get a little bit of that meaty flavor, whatever you've recently done your cast iron. But yeah, in this normal stainless steel, you just go a little bit lower, a little bit slower. Um, you can also do this in like a ceramic situation. Okay. And then this is really a recipe where we're using the onion as a flavor element. So we want it to be thoroughly mixed in. I'm going to add in my herbs. Really living on the edge with that cross, given how fluffy I tend to be. Cool. And then I can juice in Now, because I'm waiting for my veggies to just finish cooking, I'm not mixing in my spaghetti squash until the last second. If your veggies are well done, you can do this whole flavor process with the squash in there. Then I'll add my garlic in now because I don't want to have that burnt flavor, so I blend it in. And then... Don't forget your zest. Oh, yeah, All right. I like to zest upside down so it keeps inside here and then I can just push it all in at once. Gives me a better idea of how much I've used as well. All right. Use the residual heat to finish the sauce. And then, spaghetti squash. So this is a recipe that definitely, if you notice, took a lot, I'm sure you noticed, um, took a lot of cutting and prep. However, it came together very quickly. So had I pre-done that squash the day before and pre-cut everything the day before, this dish would have taken no time at all. And I will say it, the texture of this dish does lend itself very well to be reheated. Um, we, after we made some test batches of this, we had, I was eating it for several days and it made a great side dish for, I just had cooked up some chicken. Um, but you know, you don't need to think about this as being specifically Thanksgiving. It could definitely be for any day. And I also like dishes like this that we actually don't need to reheat. This dish would be just as good cold. Yeah, or like more of a, you know. Room temp situation. Room temperature, but yeah, like not fully hot, hot, hot. Yeah. That's another good point at Thanksgiving because some of your dishes, you know, 
if they're not piping hot, they're not going to be super tasty. But if, if they are, then if you have something that can kind of sit out a little, you know, certain, certain things definitely lend themselves better. Like, I don't know about you, but I want my mashed potatoes really hot. And I want my, probably if I'm having something like a green bean casserole, I want it hot. Right. But this is a great option. You're right. Because it doesn't have to be piping hot. We could have it sitting, you know, waiting while we're carving that turkey up. All right. I'm a little shook, but it actually is a top. I don't know how this is happening. It, and, it, and it looks, did it get a little brown and crispy for you? It did. Um, I would add, if I, I could definitely add a little bit more crispy action on color, but because of the gluten-free situation, this is not going to get browner. Yeah. And as I said, if you wanted to get more browning, you could do like a little spray action and then even maybe prop it under the broiler, you know, could help you. Yeah. But it's definitely holding its own, which is nice. And then I'll go ahead and finish up this. So I pre-made, we gave you bonus recipes online. I pre-made the veggies. Um, so Heather, if you want to switch just to the front camera. Yep. Um, yep. Our stuffing held complete shape, but you can see because their stuffing is pretty muted in color, uh, the fennel's a little muted in color, that fennel frond and the parsley really help, but then I can able to add something a little bit more colored and texture on the plate. So what else do you have there? Okay, so I made our Moroccan spice chicken thighs um, and the wi roasted winter veg. The can, you roasted winter veg. can you hold your plate up a little closer so I can really get a good look? It's really dark in here. No, it, that's good. I can really see. You know what's funny? I feel like that spaghetti squash and fennel dish right now reminds me of, it looks a little like sauerkraut, but I know it's not. I'm praying it doesn't taste like sauerkraut. No, it doesn't taste like sauerkraut. I'm just saying it has the similar texture. That looks like a very colorful, nice plate. I Yeah. And like it also it. is gives us a little bit of our starch action without having it to be too much of a um, starch element. So we have a lot of vegetables happening on this plate, which is where we're going to get that fiber and our satiation. Yeah. And so as Amber mentioned, and as Miss Lynetta mentioned earlier today, I just dropped in the chat the link to the um, page that we have on our website where all of these ARP class recipes live. For this month, I included some links to some extra stuff. All of those are vegetable focused. Um, Miss Lynetta did shout out the butternut squash mac and cheese. That one's really delicious. If you are, if your family does a mac and cheese and you're looking at for a way to maybe lighten it up just a little uh that can be a great option for you to add to your table this year and we've got some other great ones there for you too um does anybody have any questions concerns miss lanetta how did you make out i'm going to come over to our gallery view so we can see everybody wow I'm, I, I, well I, the only item i cooked today was the fennels and spaghetti squash i did cook the cornbread dressing okay i'm pretty much at that recipe down pat, but it came out, it looks beautiful and it tastes delicious. And I have to add that when I added the Parmesan cheese, it kind of turned it into a, a mac and cheese type situation going on with vegetables added. So yeah, you get really some good. get some nice cheesy creaminess. And I will say, you know, when we use things like Parmesan, you know, it's a nice aged cheese and it's got a lot of flavor, right? And we don't have to use a lot. A little goes a long way to really get the taste buds going and also to give you that like nice creamy texture that you're referencing. I feel like, you know, it's that's a great tip too, to think about like how we can add as much flavor as possible without breaking the bank in terms of calories and fat and all of that. Um, and a nice Parmesan cheese will really help you out big time. So you can see it's nice. And oh, Heather, can you highlight hers? Yep, 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 yep. So it's nice and stringy and gooey and hot and the vegetables are crunchy. Mm -hmm. So I'm really looking forward to this dish. Really awesome. looking forward to it. And while um, I'm speaking, Heather, I wanted to remind folks next month will be our last show of this year. We're still planning um, exactly how we're going to roll out 2022. 
but if you have any suggestions of recipes or dishes you would like to see prepared, um, we'll discuss it and see if we could modify it as we discuss different recipes for appetizers. And from what I understand from Heather and Amber, you buy phyllo dough and the rest is up to you. You can stuff it with an appetizer when you host your holiday events or as an appetizer to your um, Christmas dinner. Heather, did you have anything else to add about next month? No, I mean, we're just actually later this afternoon, we're going to be doing some uh, recipe testing to finalize our plans for the little appetizer menu we've got going on for next month. So I'm excited for it. I think it's going to be a good one. Hopefully we'll throw some surprises in there for everybody. The class is on Wednesday, December 15th. And as soon as we get those recipes typed up, we'll get them sent out so that, um, you know, we can get the sign up link going for y'all so you can plan ahead, but save the date, December 15th, same time, 1030, same place, Zoom. <laughs> Great. And remember, you can always email us if you have a question to ask the chef and Heather and Amber, as you can see, they're great at answering questions and they do PowerPoint presentations and everything. It doesn't get any better <laughs> than that. So we're really looking forward to seeing all of you all next month. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. It was great. Enjoy the recipes. Thank yes. you. Thank you. We hope Thank you. It was fun. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good rest of your day, everybody. And enjoy Thanksgiving. Yes, happy Thanksgiving. Yes. Bon appetit.